speaking of infidelity, not me committing it, but like, you know, if I have doubts, if I have doubts, if I have doubts, I'll look at it again. in the back we are wearing the new marnie uniqlo work jacket love it with this adorable pocket here it is the perfect book jacket look at that we got clarice lispector's the chandelier and taking my new baby out for a spin yes we love her. Sunny. Very cute. Love that it has this like open flap here. Magnetic. Um, on the this side too. Very cute. Yes, it is raining. There's an umbrella in here. Wish me luck. Lispector. We're about a hundred pages in and of course nothing has really happened and that's okay. This one is about Virginia and her brother Daniel who live on Quiet Farm which uh, I feel like is like rural. Big house, feels empty, not much goes on which is interesting because in that nothingness the imagination breathes I think Lispector is really good at allowing that think tank for her characters to really blossom, yet also shrivel up and create these really cerebral, anxious moments for her characters. It's, uh, I think, the first time Lispector looks at siblingship, which is really interesting. It reminds me, some way, shape, or form, of a Virginia Woolf book. Can someone correct me but it reminds me of either i forget if it's the waves or to the lighthouse or the years i forget which one it is but um about siblings which virginia wolf book am i thinking of with brothers and sisters yeah it reminds me of this just like the cruelty between brother and sister the beginning formations of the natural cruelty that exists between man and woman the tensions the hierarchies really really interesting. I think the longest of the Spectre's novels actually, this is like 300 pages. There's this like really beautiful moment somewhere where the narrator Virginia is like playing with clay and she creates these like figures, moments out of the clay and uh, she feels like God. She begins to doubt the shapes of things she like doubts the creations as if God doubts creations and it's like this really interesting elevation from like child, human, feeling like the creator, God, and the doubt of God. As if God doubts his own existence. It's really, 
really interesting. But yeah, classic The Spectre, enjoying it so far. I am so sweaty, so gross. The weather was very nice today though. I thought it was going to rain, but it was just windy and sunny. Yeah, it was nice. I'm gonna go to bed, Ooh, shower, then go to bed. And yeah, um, that was really creepy. Hello all, it is a Thursday, very rainy and gloomy afternoon. Just got back from work. I'm here to update you on two books that I finished over the weekend. Cannibal Metaphysics. It's very difficult. I will say it was not an easy read, especially if you are not an anthropology major. Even with like my anthropology 101 class that I took, this was a lot to take in. The entire notion of the book is about decolonizing the current thought and viewpoints that we have on indigenous people and uh, we want to move away from that and switch to something that we shall quote unquote call perspectivism to see the world as human before we as humans have sort of uh, taken over this place on earth. It's just this idea of going back to being human to a singular humanity. For example, wolves and how they see humans. A wolf will just see us as another part of this world. But for us, when we see a wolf, we immediately think animal. And when we think animal, we think, oh, savage, barbaric. Animal as an adjective versus a noun while the wolf sees us as nothing more but part of this world. And going back to that viewpoint, and also, like if a wolf drinks the blood of another animal, ultimately we think, or at least in a literary sense, oh how barbaric, how animalistic. When the wolf, when it drinks blood, sees it as almost as if it is drinking beer just another form of nourishment. And going back to that, singular humanity, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Another interesting thing I picked up from the book was that, I forget which indigenous group of people it was, but they saw people as not having points of views, but, ha but being a point of view. As a collective, as a tribe, it's really beautiful in that uh, this community, this tribe is like a gemstone, you know? full of reflections and refractions of themselves and how they perceive the world and just this like singular sort of beauty. Oh god, I didn't even talk about who this person is, like who, who this is by. <laughs> Sorry. Cannibal Metaphysics by Eduardo Viveros de Castro. He is Brazilian anthropologist. Format of this was originally a talk done in French and then translated into the format of a book. But it requires a lot of pre-reading from Levi Strauss, Felix Guattari, and Gil Deleuze, who are anthropologists. There are so many footnotes that reference them to the point where they take up much of the text itself. And so it's important that you read them before you actually get like the most out of this. Cause I don't, I think like you'll probably get, well, at least for me, I only got about like 50% of this without prior knowledge or readings of any of those other anthropologists. What did I take away from this as someone who does not study anthropology? I think it has a lot of value in a world where we think we are so divisive. It's time. It's time to not just put ourselves in the shoes of others, but really in the feet of others, like the bare soul. From soul to soul, S-O-L-E to S-O-U-L. Is that corny? I mean, because to put yourself in one's shoes already assumes that people actually have shoes. Which shoes? Where do they get their shoes? Do they have enough money for shoes? We have to re-examine our privileges and really look at the point of view of someone beyond laces and shoe cleaners and polishes. We really need to look at the feet. 
if that makes any sense. There's a humanity in that, I promise. We really need to look at other viewpoints and find ways in which we can be more accepting of other points of view through uh, the ways that Eduardo looks at. Probably my most difficult read thus far for 2022. It felt very textbooky, and I will say I do not miss that. Yep, moving on, we finished this over the weekend as well. Beauty of the Husband by Anne Carson, described as 29 tangos, which I would describe as not poem but prose that examine what it means to be in a relationship, exploring that single doubt, and every single romantic relationship has this doubt whether he will leave or whether he will stay. That doubt sort of explodes into this overthinking that Carson writes through. To a certain extent, it felt very Lana Del Rey, like in between Born to Die to Ultraviolence and sort of the ennui of it all. I mean, I think the, the seed, the beginning, is really interesting, but it's less of a meditation and more of this sort of tireless test of seeing how far she can go in overthinking. But there are some moments, can I read some of the moments, the really cool moments? She, she does have a lot of fun with her words. From air to damp, after which one recollects autumn, supposing one is trying to recollect that season. Exquisite. Beautiful. They fall asleep and dream of muffled corridors, greenish glow along the edges of mirrors, faces, cities. Snow spins over it, down over it all. All myth is an enriched pattern, a two-faced proposition, allowing its operator to say one thing and mean another, to lead a double life. Hence the notion found early in ancient thought that all poets are liars. And from the true lies of poetry trickled out a question, what really connects words and things? Not much, decided my husband. Yeah. So we have infidelity, man versus woman, what it means to love, lust, touch, infidelity, again. TLDR, men are terrible. And it's a shame that we've gotten to this point in, you know, like that new, uh, what's his name? He did Ex Machina. He just came out with a film called Men. Is exactly this. We already know that men are terrible, but I guess for whenever this came out, I should be more forgiving. 2001, men are terrible. I'm pretty sure women thought men were terrible back then. In 2022, does it, is it still fresh? Does it have some sort of freshness? Yes, to a certain extent. I feel like if you are doubting, this book will be troubling for you but I think it will make you rethink some of the questions that you've began with and give you even more questions. And though that may not sound great, I think it has a lot to offer in lying, cheating, the power imbalances that men and women pit on each other, and all its blood and gory, gory bits. And Carson for you. Very quick read very short snippets so her readings of Keats. So yes, very interesting. I might, you know, pick it up later in the future if I'm ever <laughs> thinking of infidelity. Not me committing it, but like, you know, if I have doubts, if I have doubts, if I have doubts, I'll look at it again. I hope that was entertaining. <laughs> Be well, do good work, keep in touch.